Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. We are in a CUNY library today for the simple reason that our studio is shut down while the engineers install some fabulous new bells and whistles. But whenever one gets the chance to corner my guest today, one must seize the opportunity, and I have. He is Clyde Haberman of the New York Times, foreign correspondent, city hall bureau chief, columnist, editorial writer, a brilliant career. Clyde also teaches an honors course at Hunter College in the spring on the city and its many issues. He is from the Bronx, I'm from the Bronx, couple of New York guys talking about the city. Next. Clyde Haberman, welcome. It's good to see you. Great pleasure, Tony. Uh, talking about your brilliant career at the Times, almost 40 years now? More than. More, more than. than? I'm older than at the Times. I thought I was you know, older actually, than you look. I actually started it as a copy boy, as it was called, back in 1964. So You were a stringer, I think, for the Times when you were at CCNY. And given that experience, who would have thunk? you would have a very fine, more than 40-year uh, career at the Times. Tell us that story. Oh, my old sin. You're going to make me trot out my old sin. I was a stringer, which is a part-time correspondent, yeah. uh, a term that comes from the fact that once upon a time, uh, you were paid, actually, I was paid by the length of the piece, uh, but before my day, the length was measured on a longest string, which was marked quarter of a column long, half a column, and so on, <laughs> hence the word stringer. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, stupidly, in a long list of uh, awards in tiny type that were being given at CCNY, made up a fake uh, with a salacious reference to a Ernest Hemingway character, Jake Barnes, from mm -hmm. The Sun Also Rises. And it was very amusing to me, and not at all amusing to A.M. Rosenthal, the Metro editor, who... But now this was buried in the... You know, oh, it was buried in like three columns of what's called agate type. It's the kind of yeah. type that you see for uh, box scores on sports events. And uh, uh, I, I gave the death blow to that list, and never, they never ran it again. Uh, and, uh, and I was banished, and I wound up at the New York Post, and then made my way back to the Times uh, roughly 10 years later. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think it's an amusing story, and it is on one level. Uh, it's only three lines of, you know, minuscule type. But when a. Abe Rosenthal, A.M. Rosenthal, died in 2006, I wrote a column on how the guy who fired me was right. And because by then we'd had the scandal of the execrable Jason Blair, and USA Today was reeling from made-up stories by a guy named Jack Kelly, uh, there had been Stephen Glass at the uh, New Republic, yep. Janet, famous Janet Cook uh, inventing a, a, an eight-year-old heroin addict who didn't Post. exist for the Washington Post, on and on. And there were, I mean, those were class A felonies commit compared to my misdemeanor, but they were all crimes, including my minor theme, because I violated the basic rule. We don't knowingly put falsehoods in the paper. It's as simple as that. Newspaper is not a cathedral, certainly a newsroom is not, but we do have a concept of sin, and that is cardinal sin. And uh, um, we make mistakes, we do put falsehoods in the paper, but not knowingly. And despite the blather coming from uh, an unnamed person in Washington about fake news, it ain't. It's real. Sometimes it's incorrect, but it's incorrect for human error, but not for what he's thinking. Uh, you're an avid Yankee fan, and uh, the season uh, looks to be, I mean, miraculous. Did you plot when they signed John Carlos Stanton? I, that was a mixture of that and a mixture of, uh-oh, you know, are these two home run hitters going to get along? And we still need some better pitching. Um, I th CC Thabat uh, Sabathia is coming back, and that's good. I like the guy a lot, but... Uh, um, He's not a kid, and uh, we'll see if he can hold up. And Tanaka has been 
on and off, so we shall see. But it's really exciting. I mean, those two guys, Judge and John Carlos Stanton, together had something like 111 home runs last year. Let's talk about some city issues. Yes, and, sir. And, and top of mind for me is uh, a pet peeve. Well, it's, it's not a pet peeve. It's a lot more than that. I, I don't know how to contain my anger over the over the state of the subway system, the crisis in the subway system, bus system. And your paper has done some remarkable reporting it on has. that uh, in the last couple of months. And we find that, uh, not surprisingly, uh, as the Times said, so, so uh, summing it up, this, what we're facing, is the fruit of decisions by governors and mayors, Democrats and Republicans, both from Pataki to Cuomo, from Giuliani to de Blasio, ignoring the system and diverting money away from it. Uh, let's, what, what do you think about it? What absolutely, you? absolutely right, uh, what you just said. Look, I hate to keep going back to, you know, when I was a kid and doing the geezer routine, but anybody more or less our age will remember how bad the subways really were. Sure. Uh, when I went off, when I went off to Japan, it was my first foreign assignment. Uh, this was, uh, I got the assignment uh, in late 1982. If you missed a train, if you missed your train in New York then, uh, back in 1982, you really couldn't be sure you'd ever see another one. Uh, it was that bad, including the incredibly graffiti scarred subway cars yeah. all over. Well, I was thinking of your time in Tokyo as, as perhaps giving you an interesting and perhaps unique perspective, not unique, but an interesting perspective on, on riding our trains if you've ridden the Japanese Well, it was train. extraordinary. I mean, I went there with a, you know, a little bit of a chip on my shoulder in the extent of, okay, I'm gonna save string on all the things here that don't work. And, and there are some things that don't, but the subways were not one of them. Uh, I, I lived, my life there the way I do here, riding, getting around basically by subway and occasional taxi cabs. And every Japanese subway station has a schedule when the trains are gonna come, 901, 904, 909, etc. Five years I lived there, not a single time that I took a train was a train so much as a minute late. Not in once. Five years. Not once. Now I wasn't in Tokyo all the time, I no, traveled a but, lot, but, but I was there for uh, there are at least you know 60 to 70 percent of the time, not once, uh, and the sense of decay here was just awful. So I put and on your point that about New York, if if if, if you missed a train, you couldn't be sure you really what was couldn't. coming. In Tokyo, they they give you a formal, almost like apology. Right, exactly. If it, I mean, on occasion, uh, you know, somebody kills himself hurls himself onto the track, so things have to stop it. But by and large, it, it works perfectly. Um, I mention all this because as bad as things are now, it really was worse 35 years ago or so. Uh, and it did bounce back. It bounced back, you mentioned Dick Ravitch, who was the uh, chairman of the MTA back then. He got a lot of money. He got a lot of cooperation. There was this, uh, from politicians, from uh, others that uh, there were labor unions. Uh, well, he brought unions. together the labor, the business right. community, uh, the politicians, there was a, and fashion that five year. There was a sense of crisis. Capital uh, plan. In the same way that we had had a crisis a few years earlier during the great fiscal crisis, the mid 70s, where those same uh, major entities in New York, labor, uh, banks, um, uh, politicians, and so on, worked together. We don't have that now. Uh, you don't hear about. Uh, the business community being involved in a significant way. You don't hear labor saying, okay, we'll take a cut here and there on some uh, dopey work rule uh, that is yeah. really feather bedding. Uh, and you don't have the politicians, Lord knows, agreeing. I mean, this uh, endless fight between the mayor and the governor over who should fund it is not only tedious, it's uh, corrosive. And, uh, and it doesn't help most people to hear from somebody like me, oh, it was really bad back in the early 1980s, and it's, it's much better now. They only know what is now. Uh, yeah, of course. And, 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 and it's falling apart. And it's falling apart because uh, they uh, did divert money, and there are work rules that are uh, excessive, perhaps. There are all sorts of factors that go into this. And you mentioned Giuliani and Pataki. They started it. 
Giuliani just began to take money that was supposed to be the city's contribution to the MTA and diverted it for other purposes. And Pataki said, well, hell, I'll do the same thing. And successive governors, Democrats uh, or Republicans alike, as you say, continued it. And I don't bring it up, Clyde, to, to try to compare, oh, this is really bad and it's worse than, better than. That's not my point. My point is that fundamentally, there is no accountability. Governors come and go and they treat this MTA as, a, as an ATM machine. Mayors come and go and they treat it as an ATM machine. And nobody pays attention or very few people pay attention. And so we wind up with, with facts like the Times reported that, uh, for instance, over the years that they looked at, a billion and a half dollars was diverted by governors uh, and mayors diverting tax revenues that were earmarked for the subways, a billion and a half dollars. And then they gave it a particularly, what they called a particularly egregious example. Cuomo, Governor Cuomo, forced the MTA to send five million dollars upstate to bail out three uh, state-run ski resorts that were having trouble because there wasn't any snow. Right. There's no accountability. I think a lot of the authorities that we have, Tony, were created to uh, deflect accountability from political leaders, whether it's the Metropolitan Transportation Authority or various housing authorities and, and, board, and authority. board authority being another good example, that they've served as a, uh, you know, you know, no es mi problema uh, kind of uh, entity. And yeah. it's, it, it's, it's a real problem. The governor, uh, who now is trying uh, to uh, put it all on the mayor, or put a, a lot of it on, because and dragging out a uh, document from 1953, he might as well haul out the Dead Sea Scrolls while he's at it, uh, 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 proving that the city owns the subway, therefore it's on it. Somehow the city didn't own the subway, didn't have responsibility in December of 2016 when he opened the new Second Avenue subway, and he was saying, who do you think runs the MTA? And it was, you know, me. So, um, okay. You and I have been around a long time. You forgive politicians, uh, their egos to some degree, uh, and crowing when the sun rises because I made the sun rise and I'm not responsible for the sun setting. But the sun is setting right now on the subway and it's time to step up. Well, you, yeah, and you, Second Avenue subway, good example. Times reporting. Two and a half billion dollars a mile to build that thing. Six times as ex expensive per mile as any other system in the exactly. world. Paris is extending and they're doing it for, I think, 450, 500, five, five, uh, 500 million a mile. And we're uh, one sixth of the Right. And Paris is hardly a cheap city. Tokyo, same deal. It's not, I mean, I practically had to carry Krugerrands to buy a hamburger there. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's an expensive city. So there's no reason why it should be this way. Uh, it, it, in much the same way that there's no reason to put it on the most simple way. The, 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 there's no reason why, uh, whether it's Con Ed crews or, or subway crews, why does everybody always seem to be standing around? I mean, yeah. I, I, mean I, I, I know I'm going to get, spare me your letters on this. I know that the, these are hardworking people, folks, but, uh, but you can't persuade me that it's done as efficiently as it could be. No, and the Times also reporting uh, as, the, as the Second Avenue subway was being built, th there was a, t a point at which they brought in some, you know, uh, pr pros from other cities to just observe what was going on. And they, they go down into the tunnel, and they're tunneling under Second Avenue. And this pro, this, this uh, mass transit uh, executive from Portland or Seattle, right is astounded as he looks at the, on the floor of you know, where they're doing this, and this counts 28 people, and thinks to himself, what are 28 people doing here? We, you can do this with those machines that grind through the stone to make the tunnels, uh, basically uh, is, uh, operate themselves. He said, you know, seven people can do this right, job. Right. So feather bedding and, you know, and, and work rules that I'm all in favor of, of full employment, but, but it does come at our expense. And I don't want to just put it on labor force. No, it's not. It is, uh, again, political decisions that are 
that are not made. And, 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 and I keep using the word diffusion of, of responsibility, but the system was created so that nobody really could be pointed at. And I guess I wonder, and, and unless we change the system, unless we have accountability, will we go through for forever a series of, you know, good years, bad years, good years, bad years? I mean, so maybe some people would like, let's say, the mayor to uh, get control of the subway and bus system the way um, Michael Bloomberg succeeded in getting control of the education system, which also was under uh, the, uh, the a Board of Education that was a separate entity that you could throw tomatoes at if you didn't like what was going on. And that has certain appeal, but in the end, I think it's impractical because we are a regional network now. I don't know how you fully separate the subway now from the commuter lines. Um, our whole economy is, is a, a unified one of city and suburbs, and so that you have to have some kind of all-controlling uh, system. Uh, you, you could probably ease the subway um, um, crowding if buses were faster. Yeah. Uh, and the way to do that is uh, um, really clearing bus lanes. Um, we're shooting here at 34th and 5th Avenue, and they've done a pretty good job of clearing the bus lanes on 34th Street so that the yes, number 34 are. bus and number 16 bus and others can go across pretty fast. If they did that on a whole bunch of streets on 5th Avenue, on Broadway, uh, uh, a lot more people might be willing to take buses. You mentioned uh, the Port Authority, and I'll just, uh, you know, as another one of these opaque uh, uh, agencies. Yeah. I was astounded to learn uh, back in, what, Jan uh, early January with the snowstorm at, at the airport, the JFK, the terminals, each yeah. terminal is its own fiefdom. I had no run idea. By, I didn't know Run that by, I guess, the airline. I don't know. I, the, the Port Authority has no control over Terminal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and what Terminal 1 does and Terminal 6 does, it's up to them and there's no cooperation. I, how can that be? I, you, you're asking the wrong guy. I, I learned it too for the first time. It was astounding. It makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, but the airports here uh, have been third world. Uh, Joe Biden called it that and a few people got their noses out of joint. They shouldn't have. Uh, he's right. It's, yeah. it's, Again, go back to my foreign correspondent days. I would come back on home leave uh, every couple of years, especially coming from Japan again, and and uh, uh, you'd land in, at, at JFK, and it was I, it was an embarrassment. It was like you would see all these foreigners coming in, and it was like inviting them into your home, but your home has garbage strewn across the floor of every room. Uh, you'd be led down back staircases that uh, look that they've been erected last night uh, and, and and not much has changed in this regard I mean it's still pretty damn awful I don't understand why I sometimes think well it's my fault the voters not it, partly my fault the voters fault because yeah. we keep electing these that people. is true and that is true um, um, we did an editorial that pointed out um, that everybody in the city complains left and right about Albany and how awful it is. And yet, uh, the last election two years ago, 98% of the state senators and assembly yeah. members who ran for re-election won re-election, 98%. Uh, uh, that ain't exactly a throw the bums out mood. No. No, it and, 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 and you don't have, and for various reasons, you don't have um, uh, true competition, even, he, even in this city. Uh, uh, congratulations to Mayor de Blasio on a, on a big uh, re-election victory, but he had no real competition. No, no competition. We could spend another hour on this, but <clears throat> I'd like to move on to some of your writing, which is always uh, elegant, always luminous. And I was looking at a piece you wrote recently, which was a lovely farewell to two movie houses in the city, Lincoln Plaza on Broadway and 62nd and Sunshine down on uh, Houston. Um, 
That's a shame. It is a shame. Uh, a city like this should be able to uh, um, have that. I mean, we do still have movie houses that show old films. Yeah. Uh, um, they were, um, I am a movie buff, and, and, and they were my education with theaters like that. The, the old failure would still exist, renovated on, on Upper Broadway, the mm -hmm. New Yorker, the Bleecker Street Cinema down in the village. Uh, um, Real estate, real estate, real estate. Real estate. Uh, we are uh, in the hands of uh, uh, a real estate boom, which on one hand is very good. On another, uh, there's a, a rapaciousness on the part of landlords that is uh, uh, greatly upsetting because it greatly affects the look of our city. You go to many neighborhoods, conspicuous in, conspicuous in Manhattan, but other parts of Brooklyn and Queens certainly have it. Uh, one empty store after another. Yeah. Now, to some degree, it's because we've had a secular change in how we shop with the advent of Amazon and, and, and other online uh, services, but a lot of it has to do with uh, greedy landlords upping the rent so high that for reasons I can't understand because I'm not a businessman, uh, it seems to be in their favor to leave stores open and not collect anything, hoping that you know God will drop everything else, I guess, and give them another uh, big boom. I, it made me think, as you awful. talk about real estate, in effect, uh, forces forcing out these two uh, theaters, it made me think of an old uh, slogan, I think it was a utility here in New York, build we must for, for a greater growing, New York, for or a growing, growing New, York. New York. Yeah, I think what that was, was that? Con Ed, I think. Con I think it was Con Ed. A growing, I thought it was for a greater New York. I think and it was, I was for gonna, growing New York. Uh, anyway, they're building, My they're building, is. and I don't know if it's a, you know, there's certainly the city's growing, but I, I think it's losing some of its character. There is that. Uh, also, a lot of the uh, uh, super high, uh, tall buildings that are being put up uh, do not take into account, uh, again, the existing infrastructure and what it can handle. So that when you had, when Riverside Boulevard was created mm -hmm. um, from 72nd down into the 50s on the Hudson River, um, uh, I think that was a Trump project. Uh, the, uh, uh, it took a long time before they expanded a little bit the 72nd Street subway station at Broadway. Uh, meanwhile, you people were packing them in like crazy. Uh, uh, the same thing has hap happened uh, on the east side, 86th Street. Yeah. Uh, I, I really have been living in, in fear that the crowds surging on that platform during rush hour are going to get so great one day that people are just going to be inadvertently pushed onto the track. I, th I think that uh, uh, the, the, the one, you know, the one, two, three line, the, the 72nd Street is so narrow. I mean, I'm like you, I don't, own, I don't have a car, I don't own a car. I use the subways and the occasional taxi. I'd, when I get, you know, if I travel on, the, if I get out of that subway at 72nd and, and Broadway in rush hour, whoa, that's... And, and we're relatively privileged living, uh, you know, in Manhattan as we do. Um, if you're um, stuck on the outer reaches of the F train, uh, it does crawl a lot. Yeah. And yeah. not for nothing, uh, the N and the R sometimes referred to as the never and the rarely. So, uh, you know, I, I, so, so, you know, to some degree I'm whining as a, as, as a relatively privileged Manhattanite, but, uh, well, but th this is still a part of the city. <laughs> Before we run out of time, I, I want to talk some more about your writing. You had a piece about uh, the question of, um, uh, you know, what has happened in the, in the, in the wake of the, the, the sexual abuse scandals, powerful men being brought down, right. but with them, prod, many projects, I mean, I love the headline, and I guess you don't write the headline, but the, but the, uh, the, the piece, uh, Clyde's piece was uh, headlined, he's a creep, but wow, what an artist. Well, uh, it's an age-old question. If you is. separate art from the artist, then if you go uh, down the list of some that I use, for example, Caravaggio was basically a murderous thug, and uh, um, Ezra Pound was a Nazi sympathizer, and uh, T.S. Eliot was a virulent anti-Semite. Uh, we can, uh, Norman Mailer stabbed his wife. Uh, uh, Walt Whitman was, was comparing uh, African Americans to baboons. To baboons. I mean, it's, it's uh, so down the line, not to mention all, you know, manner of sexual predators. And uh, this is probably not the time, not when we were in our hashtag MeToo moment, uh, 
uh, to raise this question, uh, but, but it is a question that needs to be asked at some point. You know, should all Kevin Spacey movies be banned forever? There are people who would say yes. I would argue the opposite. Woody Allen is going through this same issue, and we can go down the line. Harvey Weinstein, who, whose sins uh, and predation started all this, uh, at least the revelations in the Times and then amplified right. by, by uh, Ronan Farrow in The New Yorker, um, is, um, is giving us uh, uh, th this moment, but Harvey Weinstein, to go back to him, produce some terrific movies that are going to endure. So again, you know, do we just simply, you know, burn the celluloid or, you know, I know they're digitized now, but uh, my answer well, would be no. No. And as you point out in the piece, great art is often made by really terrible people. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And we're, we're seeing it with Chuck Close uh, ex exhibits and, and down the line. Um, you're doing retro report. Uh, give us a thumbnail of uh, retro report is based uh, uh, primarily on video, but I write an essay slash commentary that accompanies it in the in the Times. It's a separate organization. Uh, these are longish videos, typically uh, 12, 14 minutes uh, long, that look back at major news stories of the past, sometimes the recent past, sometimes going back to the 50s, even the 40s and 30s, and how those issues resonate still today. Uh, we've done it on all sorts of things uh, from uh, dictatorships in El Salvador to uh, 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 questions about uh, should you inoculate your children, which has come up a big issue. It, it's not just a traipse down memory lane, which is Well, it's, a, it's an but, effort to, but it's just, perhaps perhaps to, a to show how the past yeah. can inform the it, present. Absolutely, and there is a continuum in our world. One of the, it, it addresses one of the weaknesses in our line, uh, our line of work, is that our collective memory isn't brilliant. We tend to think that the world, you know, was created at the earliest last week, and anything that happened before that was uh, ancient history. And it's probably gotten worse in the age of, of smartphones and, uh, and and all. But um, but this corrects one of our our, our, our shortcomings. I mean, even all the uh, stuff going on involving this particular president, we've had comparable crises before. I mean, yeah. it's exaggerated because everything about him is is you know cartoonish, and, <laughs> in my view. But um, but we've had. A massive fraud crises. in the view of uh, Philip Roth. Yeah, well, I, who am I to argue with Philip Roth? But right. uh, um, but we've had um, we've had Warren Harding, we've had Richard Nixon, and we've had a few others who are not exactly going to go down uh, and be <clears throat> immortalized on Mount Rushmore. There is so much more I wish we had time to cover, <laughs> Sorry, including... I, blab, I blab on and on. No, you're wonderful, including the, the, that other Haberman whose name appears on the front page of the oh, paper mean, almost every day in the White House car, so your What's wonderful name? daughter, Maggie. I yeah. uh, wish we had time, more time to talk about her, but it's great to see you. Great pleasure, Tony. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.